Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the Dataversity webinar today, Improving Advanced Data Prep and Analytics and Spreadsheets, sponsored today by Altrix. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. If you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Lisa Aguilar and Hassan Hababati. Lisa is a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Altrix. She is passionate about the analytics space and showing how to innovate analytic technology can and how innovative technology can uh, help analysts, uh, I can say that well, move uh, past mundane data tasks, evaluate their skills and expertise, and deliver ever increasingly sophisticated insights. Hassan is a solutions en engineer at Altrix. Hassan empowers customers by helping them to get to helping them get to Insight Fast. Hassan teaches data science related topics at the University of California, Irvine. Hassan has uh, hands-on analytics experience and was instrumental in launching various analytics practices in the OCLA area. And with that, let me turn it over to Lisa and Hassan to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shana. So, uh, as Shannon mentioned, I'm Lisa Aguilar, and with me I have Hassan. I uh, wanted to spend a few quick moments going through what we're going to be talking about today. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you so much for joining us and taking the time out of your busy schedules. We hope that you will be able to learn uh, something interesting out of what we uh, showcase today. Now, throughout this webinar, we're going to be focusing on a few things. We, uh, first and foremost, recently commissioned a report by IDC. And we are going to be going over some of the results of that report and really focusing on some of the most prevalent use cases, activities, and function analysts like yourself uh, do when conducting analysis in, in spreadsheet-like software. Then we're going to take a quick look at the top barriers organizations face and then um, some of the recommendations that came out of this report. And finally, my colleague Hassan here is going to be doing a quick demonstration on how you can augment your process and overcome some of the challenges uh, when working with spreadsheets. So uh, with this report, I just kind of want to level set and give a bit of a background before we dive into the details of this report and paint a picture of who participated in this survey. Uh, feedback was aggregated from over 550 respondents across a wide range of users, and they looked at uh, the usage and challenges of advanced spreadsheet usage, and we looked at it across organizations, industries, and partners. Uh, it touched on a broad range of individuals within organizations, so it wasn't skewed by one type of respondent or one uh, size of organization. Now, one of the more interesting pieces of information that was discovered from uh, this report was the fact that self-service data press and analytics via spreadsheet-like solutions has been going on for years, even prior to BI and visualization fads, and it's something that still continues to be the case today. Now, according to IDC, 8% of employees still engage with spreadsheets to do some sort of data preparation as their software of choice. Uh, the fuel of big data becoming mainstream has actually driven the desire to extract insights from all available data to brand new levels and is resulting in an extremely high demand for self-service data preparation and analysis by tech-savvy business users that want to be able to access their data without having to depend on other departments, which is also fueling the usage of spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet analysis and advanced spreadsheet analysis in business units today. In addition to that, IT is actually playing a big role in this process and trying to understand and determine how, as an internal organization, they can help business units deliver results faster and answer the questions that impact um, employees and impact organizational directions quickly. Now, when we look at the data of the IDC report and uh, we look at the usage, 
Three of the most frequent uses of spreadsheets focus on data integration, ad hoc data analysis, and data visualization. Now, the typical analysis performed when using spreadsheets focuses on what-if analysis, cleansing, pivoting, and prepping that data for presentations into something like a PowerPoint. Now, of those uh, common functions that analysts perform, at least on a weekly basis, a lot of the functions begin with summarizing data, manipulating it, blending that data, building what-if statements, and then going into advanced statistical calculations and formulas. Now, it may not seem like there's a lot uh, there, it's pretty common practice, uh, but on average, people who are doing this are spending about 26 hours per week working in spreadsheets. So finding a better way to perform these processes is actually critical. It's critical to your success, it's critical to your success if you're using spreadsheet-like software. Um, and then it's critical to the insights that your organizations are depending on to leverage and make decisions. So how can we become more efficient? Well, it starts with some of the basic techniques that a lot of people do when beginning work with data. One of the first things that people do when they begin to work with data in spreadsheets is they make a copy of that data and paste it into a spreadsheet. Now, sometimes that's done because you don't want to lose the original. Uh, sometimes it's done because it's the path of least resistance and copying and pasting from a source is the easiest way to begin to actually work with that data. But copying um, and pasting data from the source into a spreadsheet is one of the biggest wastes in working with data. So ask yourself, are you copying and pasting data from its original source into a spreadsheet before you've been working on it? If you are, you really need to take uh, into consideration how this wasteful this process is for you, as well as some of the insights that you're going to be developing. Now, here's why. First, it contributes to wasteful repetition in the data preparation process. In addition, copying and pasting, is, even though it's the most uh, easiest way to get data into the source that you can use to manipulate it and work with it, it isn't the most accurate way to begin the process of working with that data. It actually greatly introduces the possibility of human error. Coupled with that, IT isn't necessarily a fan of this method either. Um, they are responsible for data integrity, data security, and this Copying and pasting data from a source can result in internal policy and external compliance violations. Now, most importantly, copying and pasting data from its source into a spreadsheet before you begin working on it actually erodes the data integrity. You are not dealing with data at the source, and therefore it introduces a lack of ability to audit the data trail and validate the insights you have created. Just imagine if one of your managers or your executives discovered an error in a report that you were building and asked you to be, if they could trace it back to the source and find out where it went wrong. Do you have to tell them that you copy and pasted data from a source incorrectly into a spreadsheet and that's what introduced the error? It's a very uncomfortable conversation to ask, uh, to have, um, and it's a very uh, uncomfortable question to be asked why you're copying and pasting data from the source into spreadsheets to begin with. Now, in addition to data integrity issues that are introduced by copying and pasting data from the source, uh, working with spreadsheet also introduces risk exposure. Now, those of you who work in organizations that are focused on governance and focused on data lineage, you should be concerned with using spreadsheets for your data work. A lot of IT departments, when they hear self-service analytics, they often think of the wild, wild west and data marts and Excel spreadsheets running amok and are they old, how relevant are they? And spreadsheets really contribute to this perception. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, spreadsheets introduce the human error aspect into the analysis process. And many times over the news, I'm sure many of you have seen, there have been costly mistakes organizations have had to face due to the fact that there was a spreadsheet error. So given all these concerns, why aren't more organizations turning to alternative solutions outside of spreadsheets? Now, the results of the IDC survey break it down into three major issues. It's uh, revolving around compatibility issues with other systems within the organization that are already established and maintained. Um, there are concerns about lengthy implementation times and how quickly can you actually get started in working with an alternative solution. And there's also concerns about high costs. So spreadsheets tend to be free. 
other alternative solutions tend to cost money, and uh, how can you actually support that and fund that? Now, the reality of software applications is actually different from this perception. Uh, applications today are actually more open than ever before, and software is actually becoming easier and more intuitive uh, to use and install and get going with, reducing the learning curve and implementation times, if that's what you're worried about. Uh, it also may be more costly for organizations, as I mentioned earlier, introducing human error into spreadsheet solutions um, than it would be to pay for an alternative solution. The reality also is standalone spreadsheets never really solve the problem of preparing for data analytics. Uh, spreadsheets are great if you're working with one or two forms of data, but when you start to expand that to three or four or eight or nine or up to 15 data sets or on different worksheets, you're trying to combine them, it's going to get difficult, um, not only for you to keep track of that data in those spreadsheets and those sources, but also to manipulate the data in the spreadsheet itself. You're going to get a lot of hanging up. You may get your Excel crashing. Um, as a result, there has been an emergence of self-service analytics software, and that's putting the data preparation, data cleansing, and data merging of analytics into the hands of analysts without you having to go to different departments to get the data that you need, and without you having to turn to different departments to perform the insights that you actually need. Now, um, a lot of organizations uh, say that, well, these solutions uh, are competing against free solutions. So let's take a little bit of a circle back to some of those numbers that I talked about earlier with IDC. Now, when I said that 8% of um, organizations and 8% of the data workers within organizations are actually using uh, Excel or spreadsheet for their data work, I want you to take a look at it and what does that really mean? That means 5 million users in the United States alone and 16 million users in the rest of the world. But what does that also look like for you? you know, okay, there's a lot of people using spreadsheet like software to do analytics. What does that really mean in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, when you look at uh, the insights that I talked about earlier from IDC that on average, 26 hours per week of working in spreadsheets is wasted. Given a 40-hour work week, that equates to 65% of time wasted performing manual tasks. The majority of your week, if you think about it, and you're doing analytics and stuff in uh, spreadsheets, is spent wasted on manual aspects. 35% of this time that you're spending in your spreadsheet is wasted on just repeating simple efforts when data sources are updated. So not only are you spending a tremendous amount of your work week working with data in spreadsheets, but you're wasting an even more, uh, a greater amount of that time doing repetitive tasks. So what does this mean? It means that there is a huge population of data workers like yourself who are wasting a tremendous amount of time in their day in and out working with something that, that is a free solution. Now, when you try and quantify this, that is 1.3 billion hours wasted on duplicate work in the United States alone. That doesn't even account for the time spent on spreadsheet type software for the other data tasks that I talked about that you guys typically perform. But the truly scary number is this one. The number of hours wasted in the U.S. alone is equivalent to flushing $60 billion a year on repetitive manual tasks and spreadsheets. This should really clearly paint the picture that free isn't always free. Of the 5 million advanced spreadsheet users in the U.S., 8 of the 25 hours working in spreadsheets is spent on doing repetitive tasks, such as updating data. Based on a baseline salary estimate, that's 12,000 per worker per year just wasted because analysts are not able to automate routine manual process. Now, I can assure you, if you or your manager walked into an executive meeting with an annual budget in hand saying, we're going to allocate a couple million to repetitive manual tasks this year, I'm pretty sure that would not go over well. But the reality of it is it's happening, and it's happening every day. It's just that no one's admitting it. And 
is it because of the true cost of waste and repetitive tasks isn't really understood, or that organizations really don't understand that free doesn't actually equal free when it comes to spreadsheet-like software for data analytic tasks. So what does IDC recommend based on the results of the survey? Uh, users of standalone spreadsheets are unable to achieve the desired levels of integrity through the data preparation process and outcomes. And there are huge gaps between the importance of data and analysis and data integrity compared to what one is actually able to achieve in spreadsheet-like software. The big problem is the cost of maintaining the status quo of performing data work in, in spreadsheets is staggering. Free is not always free. IDC recommends that analysts and users consider self-service data preparation uh, software and self-service data analytics software as alternatives to spreadsheets and to build business cases for self-service data analytics based on productivity cost savings. They also recommend that users explain the business case for self-service data preparation software by highlighting some of the additional benefits self-service data analytics software offers, which is better control, higher levels of data work and analysis and integrity, and it helps you to provide trust, availability, security, and compliance. Now, the purpose of this webinar is to give you a sense of the benefits of using an alternative solution over spreadsheets for data analytics. Uh, spreadsheets are at the core of almost every single business, and they're not going to be replaced. Uh, the purpose here is really to highlight how an alternative workflow type solution can both augment and help your processes and tasks that you may be struggling when you are working uh, in, in a spreadsheet-like software to do your analytics. Now, uh, before we can do that, let's do some brief information on why uh, you, people use spreadsheets. So most of the time, I'm sure most of you guys are using it because it's something that you're familiar with. It's easy, it's free, it's low cost, it's always available. A lot of times people like what they can do with spreadsheets because they can instantly see the changes in the data that you're making. Now, typically, We'll co it'll cover almost everything that an analyst needs to do on a day-to-day -day basis for our data work. But as I mentioned earlier, there are really a lot of issues in working with spreadsheets. There's the productivity cost, which is huge when you start to quantify it. Um, there's the ability of trying to get past two or more data sources. There are Excel row limitations for how much data you can actually work with within a spreadsheet. Um, the other thing that tends to be a nightmare is collaboration within spreadsheets. I mean, imagine if somebody sent you a spreadsheet that had all of these formulas in them, are you going to be able to pick up that analytic task and work on it yourself? Or is that spreadsheet going to have to kind of wait until you can sit down and have a conversation with the person you created and actually go through all the formulas and functions that are in it? The other thing is, we have analysts tell us all the time, they don't trust what each other's spreadsheets they want to redo the work themselves. So those are some of the issues when working with spreadsheets. Now, what can be an alternative solution? Workflows are great augmentations to some of the spreadsheet work you may be doing. Workflows are a lot more transparent. They will allow you to understand what's taking place through each step of your analytic process because it's self-documenting. Um, and because it's self-documenting, others can quickly understand what's happened to the data quickly and easily just by looking at icons and the workflow itself. The other thing that uh, workflows do help with is because they're easy to understand, collaboration amongst uh, analysts is actually quite easy. You can create an analytic insight, pass that on over to a colleague who sits in a different department who can use it for their downstream process. The other thing is, in terms of visualizing the data, uh, spreadsheets do allow you to see the data straight away. But with the workflow, you get to see the data at each step in the process by running that process. You understand exactly what's happening to your data while it's happening. Now, another reason why workflows are a great alternative is uh, for the simple reason that a large percentage of your day-to-day -day job is repeatedly preparing and updating data when the data set changes on a daily, weekly, hourly, nightly, quarterly, or monthly basis. 
having to do that work over and over again within a spreadsheet-like environment is time-consuming and tedious. And as we talked about earlier, extremely costly, not only for you and your productivity, but for your organizations as well. Workflows actually free you from the tedious tasks of producing the same reports over and over again. They allow you to build out a process that you want to perform on your data. And whenever that data changes, you simply point to the new data set and it runs through. It doesn't require any coding and it allows you to actually move on from common data prep tasks to more advanced analytic work. So when you update your data set, um, the other thing that workflows actually allow you to do is productionalize your workflow and your analytic process. So in spreadsheets, this is typically done in tedious coding in Visual Basics or in building macros. And if you want to productionalize your work, that's, those are your only options. Workflows actually allow you to automate and schedule as data refreshes. And you don't have to worry about uh, augmenting anything as data sets changes. If you're trying to do this in Excel, visual scripts or visual basics, you will actually have to merge or recode uh, your workflows to get them to work together. With a drag and drop visual workflow, you can simply just add a secondary process and set everything on automatic. The other thing that uh, workflows allow you to do is um, really embrace analytic flexibility. You're no longer really kept to where your data is stored or what it looks like. You don't have to worry about if your data is in a SQL server. You don't have to worry about if your data is in a Teradata. You don't have to worry if your data is in the cloud and AWS and having to write custom scripts and codes to extract that data out before you can perform analytics on it. Workflows actually break down those barriers and allow you to connect to the data at those sources and bring them together visually and intuitively without turning to another department to do it for yourself. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this on over to Hassan, my colleague here, who's going to show you how a workflow process can help augment what you are currently doing in Excel. Thank you, Lisa. That was, that was mind-boggling. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and sh share my screen. And I'm going to show you today how we would build one of these workflows that Lisa was mentioning to hopefully help save time and then get back some of that $60 billion that, that we are collectively wasting. Um, what you're looking at is, um, this is Alteryx Designer. Up here on top, I have all the tools that I can use to visually build out a workflow and document a process that's going to describe how I'm going to prep, uh, clean up and blend my data. These tools are color coded to make them easier to find, but they are also organized by functional area. So I have tools to allow me to input and output data in my workflow. I have tools to allow me to prepare my data, do some data cleansing, data filtering. I can also blend my different data sets together. Um, I even have tools to do things advanced things like predictive analytics, etc. Most of what I'm going to show you today is going to exist under this favorite tab. In order to build my workflow, I'll just simply drag and drop these tools onto this open space here that we call the canvas. As I bring the tools to the canvas, the results of what I'm doing and how my data is being transformed will show up down here in this results window. This will allow me to see how each one of my tools is transforming my data and what is what and what my data looks like both before and after that tool was added to the workflow. Give me really transparency and data lineage. Over here on the left is the configuration window. As I bring each one of the tools, you will see that the configuration window changes, allowing me to configure that particular tool. So for our workflow today that we you know we want to build together, let's say I have customers all over the country and then um, I, you know, I have different regions, and then I have my salespeople or you know, the different regions send me their data and region-specific files. Um, and I want to kind of bring those files in together, make them into one data set, uh, clean that data set, and maybe do some, uh, some analysis on it. 
and I notice that I'm contributing to that to that money loss, to that $60 billion by doing this manually month, uh, week over week. Every time some new data comes in, I have to do the same repeatable task. And I would like to automate this a little bit. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and build a workflow to help me with that. In order to bring in some data, the first thing you would do is bring in this input data tool onto the canvas. Notice the configuration window changed, allowing me to configure this input data tool. We can bring in data, as Lisa mentioned, from many different types and really just making it easier for you. So you could have your data in a database connection. We have a wide variety of databases. As long as you have an ODBC, an OLE data, um, a DB um, driver, and then you have access to that database, we will allow you to bring in that data. Uh, but let's say I have um, my data in a file. Let me go ahead and navigate over to where, um, where my data is. And then let's say these are the different regions, and this is how my data comes in. If I go over here to the right to show the types. So of course not everybody follows the same rules. Some people send me their data as a comma delivered, uh, comma separated uh, CSV file. Some people send me their data as an Excel, uh, which is fine. Uh, Altrex will help me with that as well. But let's say I wanna bring in this first comma delimited CSV file representing region one. And I have about eight of those, and, that, and then I have an Excel sheet. Um, that's, that has the same type of data. So what I'm gonna do, I selected R1, and I'm gonna go ahead and click open. And you can see right away, Altrix was able to bring in that data. It shows me a sample down here in the configuration window, just letting me know that it was able to bring in some of that data. Um, but I wanna bring in more than that. I don't wanna have to create it at another um, input tool for each one of those files. I'm gonna go over here to my region file. I'm gonna replace the one Instead of R1, I'm gonna use a wildcard, and I'm gonna say bring in R star. Now if I click run, Altrex is a runtime run environment, so when I click run, it will actually go ahead and process my workflow. Notice now I have over two, uh, 2,356 records that were, that were brought in. If I look at the messages, it's actually going to show me all the files. So I was able to bring in R1 through R8 in one input tool. So now I'm going to bring in that one additional file that is actually a different type, it's an Excel sheet. I'll go ahead and drag and drop another input tool onto the canvas. And this time I'm going to navigate over to that and grab that Excel worksheet, R10. I'll select the sheet name. And now you can see that I have uh, my data down here. It looks a little bit different. Again, uh, some people do things differently and, and I have, you know, they're different systems. So it looks like here that my data is actually kind of, it's not as clean as the common delimited file. First of all, I noticed that my uh, first row of data, first row actually has data in it. So I'm gonna select this, indicating that first row contains data. But now I need to clean this up a little bit. It looks like my column headers are not where I want them to be. So I'm gonna actually have Alteryx skip the first uh, first two rows, try, you know, trying to get me to the data that I really want. In order to do that, I'm gonna use this, um, uh, I'm gonna use a sample tool. And I'm going to tell Alteryx to actually go ahead and skip the first two rows of data. And then we can examine our output and see if that's the desired result or not. And that's what's really beautiful about having a visual way to build your workflow. You actually kind of, going about it, doing it, and saying, is this what I wanted? So notice what happened. Now my data, my customer, uh, what looks like column headings are actually in the first row of data, which is exactly what I wanted, because now I have a tool that's gonna help me um, clean that up even further. I know I need to now rename these columns with this first row of data, but let's say I'm new to Altrex, uh, I'm not really sure how to do it, and I'm, I'm just learning. Uh, I'm gonna go up here in this, global search window, and I'm gonna just type the word rename. Notice Altrex searches any tools within the, within the platform that will allow you to, um, that will help you with the term that you're searching for, but also searches online help documentation and Altrex community made up of customers, Altrex associates and employees, and we're always pushing out content to help our customers. But let's say you find a tool that you like, uh, this dynamic rename is the one I'm looking for. You can open up an example and actually see how that tool is being used. And what's really, really amazing is I can actually, if I find a tool that I like, I can actually drag and drop that tool 
right onto the canvas, not even having to worry about where that tool is. And I think that's amazing because what that does to me, it keeps me in the process. It keeps me thinking about uh, the task at hand. I don't get distracted by going out and doing a Google search or anything. I, I, I find a tool, I like it, it looks promising. I'm just gonna go ahead and use it in my workflow. Dynamic uh, rename tool allows me to rename my data. There's several options. I'm gonna select the one that says, take field names from, from the first row of data. And then I'm gonna click run to have it process my data and examine my results. You can see that now my column headings actually came from that, first, from that first row of data that was buried somewhere in my data set. So at this point, I have these two data sets here. Uh, they, you know, they, uh, I'm ready to bring them together. They represent, you know, this is regions one through eight, this is region 10, um, 10 one through nine and 10, I guess. Uh, but these are all my regions, and now I'm ready to stack this, uh, these results together in one data set. I'm gonna go ahead and bring the union tool. The union tool allow, uh, is going to allow me to do exactly that, stack my data uh, together in one data set. Uh, over here on the left, I'm gonna select the manual. If, even if all my columns are the same name, you can, you can, you can have the auto config. But as a best practice, I like to do the manual config and then just look at my data and see if it's, if it's, if it's lined up correctly. Um, and it looks like most of my columns are lined up. Uh, first name, last name are called differently. Again, not everybody's following the same rules and we all are humans. So I'm gonna take the, these two columns here, first name, last name. I'm going to simply just uh, rearrange my columns to, uh, to have them line up. So I'm not, I'm not copying stuff in Excel. I'm not, you know, control C, control V and making mistakes on where I insert the column. I simply aligned all my columns to make sure they're aligned correctly. Now if I click run, I can now, I have, um, if I click on output coming out of the union, I have 2,678 records representing all my regions. You can see the region column over here. So now at this point, um, I have, this is a, you know, it looks like a decent data set. Uh, I'm gonna take a further look at it. I'm gonna, before I build, you know, a, a, a workflow and invest my time, I wanna save some time by doing some data quality, data profiling on this data before I, before I, I go ahead and use it. So I'm gonna drag uh, this browse tool over here and then hit run again. The browse tool is going to allow me to get uh, um, really quick uh, and very valuable data profiling information about the data that I just brought in. Notice my columns are now color coded, really indicating the health of this data. Uh, this is demo data, so it's very, very clean. But if you hover over the columns, it tells you how much, you know, uh, what, you know if it's nulls, if there's uh, how many null values are there, if my data is okay or not. You can, as you select a column, you can come over here to the left and you see how many unique values are there, how many nulls, how many blanks. So this way you're kind of getting this health check on your data before, uh, before you invest your valuable time building a workflow and then realizing you have bad data. But let's say that happens, and it happens sometimes, uh, and then you realize there's some things here that I need to pay attention to. As I mentioned, this is a very clean data set. Um, we offer a data cleansing tool. I'm just gonna go ahead and bring a data cleansing tool on here. The data cleansing tool allows you to do very common and often repeated data cleansing operations. Uh, things like, you know, what do I do with nulls? Uh, whether I want to replace them with blanks or zeros. Uh, you know, uh, I have unwanted characters in my data set. Maybe if I came from Excel, I have a lot of white spaces. I have a lot of, uh, maybe if I came from the web and I did some uh, web scraping, I have line breaks and tabs and things like that. Maybe there are letters where they're not supposed to be. Maybe people are putting numbers in the name field and, and it's not supposed, I can, I can clean all of that up. And what's really nice about I can do it all in one, uh, one tool. I can even modify the case if I want to make everything lowercase or uppercase, uh, I can actually hit run now. And what's really nice about these tools that I'm adding, notice there's an incoming anchor and outgoing anchor out of each one of these tools. The incoming anchor tells you exactly what the data looked like before this tool worked on it. 
And the out, outgoing anchor, the arrowhead, shows you what happened to the tool after it was processed, uh, to the t data, sorry, after it was processed by this tool. So you can see my first name, last name, they were kind of a mixed bag of different uh, uppercase. I guess they're all uppercase, and now they all turn into, into lowercase because that's what I told it to do my cleansing tool. So uh, there are different options for you uh, as well. So let's say at this point, um, Everything came in from a kind of a CSV or, or an Excel, um, and you know I can I can click on this metadata down here to sh to show me uh, kind of the metadata of what I have, and it looks like everything came in as a string, which is you know very common sometimes, and and you you may have to change some of them to numbers, and but let's say you don't want to have to worry about this, you want Alteryx to do that for you. We have a tool. Um, called Auto Field that really tells uh, Alteryx, you know what, why don't you select the best field for me based on the data that is contained in that field. So it's going to select the most optimal size and the right type of the, uh, field for that, for that column based on the data. Uh, the one exception I, 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 I make is I always unselect the zip file. Uh, just in case I have some uh, zips that are starting with zeros, I have leading zeros, and I don't want to really touch those. So other than that, it will work very nice on uh, the rest of my data types. Now if I click Run, and I, and I want to see what this uh, auto field tool did. I can click on the arrow uh, tail coming in, click on the metadata, and we saw everything was coming in as a string. Now if I click on the arrow head coming out, I can see I now have a mixed bag of different types. There's some number, there's some tr strings, and Alteryx selected the best size based on the data that was coming in. And this is dynamic. So if I have new data that's coming in, and this is part of my workflow, and Alteryx needs to adjust this, it's actually doing this every time you run the workflow. So if you have new data that's coming in, uh, this step will be automated for you. At this point, these are all my uh, kind of customer-related information coming in from all my different regions. I'm going to go ahead and bring in some transaction data. Uh, at this point, and I want to show you how we do that connecting to a database rather than uh, a flat file. So I'm going to go back to my favorite step. I'm going to bring in another input data tool. And as Lisa mentioned, there's really no artificial limits to how many of these input data tools you can have or how many rows or things like that. Uh, this time I'm going to go ahead and connect to a SQL server. Uh, we can connect to many different types of databases, as I mentioned. As long as you have the driver and then you can configure it, uh, chances are we'll be able to create a connection for you. Um, we can create a connection to that database. I have a SQL server running here on my demo machine. I'm going to go ahead and uh, connect to my SQL server and I'm going to bring in a transactions file. I can bring in this file as is or transactions table in this case, I can select some of the columns. If I have a stored procedure that I normally use to bring in my data, I can leverage that in here. I don't have to throw it away. If I want to write my own SQL code, I can do that in here as well. But for the most part, if you want to keep this as a code-free environment, uh, you're, you, know, you can do that. So at this point, I'm going to bring all my transactions. I'm going to click OK and um, update sample to see kind of what's, what's in here. So I have things about customer ID, order, order ID, store number. Uh, I have some order dates, some shipping dates, shipping methods, et cetera. So Alteryx is what I would call dates and time aware. So it knows what time it is. You can do uh, comparisons of time and dates and things like that. So let's say I want to try to figure out um, how long does it take to um, maybe ship each one of these orders. Uh, you know, we're, we notice our business is down a little bit, and I want to develop some intelligence on, you know, the causes of that. Maybe it's, it's taking too long to ship the orders, and that's hurting our sales. So I want to calculate how long it takes to uh, ship an order. In order to add any formulas or business logic to your workflow, you would use this formula tool. The formula tool allows you to update any existing columns, or you can add your own, uh, a new column if you would like. In this case, I'm going to uh, add a new column, and I'm going to call it uh, something like shipping time, because I need to understand how long is it taking to actually ship uh, my product. So I'm going to compare um, kind of the time that the a customer ordered a product and when it was actually shipped to them. So I'm going to use a function. Um, if you click on this FX button here, there's a, a lot of functions that are available to you, including date time functions. Uh, and then we have something called um, 
daytime death somewhere over here. Um, I can I can select it, or I can actually the the time diff should be over here. Okay, I for, forgot my alphabet there, and I can compare. So date one is going to be my shipping date. So I'm just I fast start typing it, shipping date. I selected my second date is going to be my order date. So that's when they ordered it, and I'm going to say you know give me the difference in days. I'll just type days here. So this is going to calculate. Uh, the duration between my shipping date and my order date. So now if I click run, I'm going to see that I have this additional column in my um, in my data set over here. If I flip over to the data, let me just make this a little bit bigger. So now I have I have a, I have shipping time indicating the number of days that it's taking to ship this product. So this is great. So now I want to see how if this is affecting the customers, you know, how is this doing? So I'm, I'm, I want to kind of develop some <clears throat> some aggregations on a customer level. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this summar, summarize tool and connect it to my data stream. And the summarize tool allows you to aggregate on whatever fields you uh, make sense for you. So I'm going to take the customer ID. Now I'm going to say, you know, uh, group by customer ID because I want to understand what is happening on a customer level. But I also want to know how many times this customer shows up in my transaction file. So if I say count, um, I can just say count. And so that's going to count how many times this customer ID shows up. And I can rename this over here so I can say, this is, represents the transactions. I also want to see the sh um, the shipping time on the customer. So that's the new this new call, a new field that I created. So I'm going to take shipping time. So that's and then I'm going to say you know what? Why don't you just average the shipping time for me? Notice I can't find I can't find the average um, um, function here because I missed a step. Uh, notice my shipping time is a string. So I can very because I have a visual workflow. I know what the previous step is. I know where I calculated the shipping time. So imagine doing this in Excel and figuring out, oh my God, where did this go wrong and what did I do? Uh, I can come back here and really no sweat. Just change this to a double, and then now uh, I fix this error. So um, imagine uh, compare doing that in Excel and how what a nightmare that would that would have been. So I'm going to go over here to numeric and I'm going to say, okay. Why don't you give me the average, the average shipping time for the customer? And while you add it, I'm going to take my sales and actually I'm going to sum the sales for the customer. So simply by selecting the fields and saying how I want to aggregate, aggregate them, I'm able to create a summary. Now if I run, I'm going to show you what the results look like. So now for this customer, ID two, he has one. He or she has one transaction. Uh, average shipping time is two, and then total sales, or you know, is five dollars and seventy six cents. So that's that's great. Um, so at, at this point, I want to see. Okay, what is um, what was the last time I had an interaction with this customer? Uh, then, so I want to calculate the number of days since the last order. Uh, so I want to try to find what is the most What's the most recent date? I can do that by actually going in the summary and then finding my order date, which is one of my columns. And I'm going to say, you know what? What is the max order date? What is the most? What is the latest or the most current? I guess order date that I have that this this client um, um, placed an order. And I'm, now I'm going to take this max order date. And I'm going to build a formula around it. Actually, let me go ahead and run, show you that. So I have max order date here. Now I'm going to actually add a formula, another formula tool. And this time, I'm going to calculate the number of days since I last interacted with this customer. And maybe this is meaningful for me. I'm going to develop some intelligence, maybe build a predictive model or something like that. So I'm going to use that date time. So I'm going to create a new column. Uh, it's called days since uh, last order, something like that, or last transaction. Um, and I'm going to use the same date time diff function that I did uh, in the first in the first formula. This time date, uh, date one is going to be my, it's going to be now. So I'm going to say time, uh, date time now, select that function. Date two is going to be uh, this max order date that I just got in my summary. So that represents the last time this customer placed an order. And now I'm going to get the difference in days. And then you can see in the data preview, Altrex shows me kind of a calculated result based on the first row of data. 
just giving me warm and fuzzy and letting me know that this data is, um, is you know, it calculated correctly and I have no, I have no errors. Now if I click run, I'm going to see that I now have a new field called days since last order and now I can, I can actually do something with this, see, you know, what is going on and, you know, uh, sort it or try to figure out what is going, going on with these customers. But what I have so far, I have kind of two sets, one going up here on top representing, you know, kind of customer data. I have transaction data going here on the bottom. At this point, I want to try to join these two data sets together. Uh, this is very similar to how you would do like a VLOOKUP in Excel or, you know, or a join in a database. But I'm going to show you how much how simple this is and how easy it is to um, fix any problems that you may have. So in order to do a join, I'm going to go ahead and click on my join tool and just bring these two data sets together. And I have to tell Alteryx how do I want to join them. I'm going to join them on customer ID. So I select customer ID from both the left and the right. Coming into the join, I have a left side and a right side allowing me that data lineage. So I can always trace my steps back and see where the data came from. Coming out of the join, I have three outputs. They're represented very well here in this Venn diagram. I have the J output, which is my inner join. I have my right unjoined. So these are records in the right input that did not match. And I have my left unjoined. So this, this would be records in my left input that did not match. Down here, I have uh, total transparency in terms of what is coming in. I see the columns that came in from the left. I see the columns that came in from the right. I can deselect. Uh, some of the columns here if I would like. Uh, customer ID is coming in twice because it's my joining field. I can actually deselect that if I want. I can deselect other columns. I can rename some of these fields if I would like. So let's say I want to take this max order field and maybe call it uh, something else like last order. So I can rename this, whatever, whatever makes sense for, for my, for my uh, flow. Now I'm going to click run. I'm going to show you the output from the join tool. And really keep in mind kind of when you do a join uh, or a VLOOKUP in Excel, the kind of information that, 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 you, that you have here that you do not have in Excel. Of course, we have the J, which is the, our inner join. So this represents the combined data set. So you can see my customer information. You can also see my transaction information all in one data set joined on the, on the customer ID. But what I see additionally, I see what did not join. So on the right, nothing, I have zero here, but I look on the left, I see things, 406 records, records did not join. What's really nice about this, I can actually take this and develop some intelligence about, about it. So these, these represent customers that did not have any transactions. Maybe I can do more outreach, more marketing to these customers. So I don't lose this output here, uh, what, whatever fell out of the join. I can, I can grab it, I can build a whole section of the workflow uh, to handle this. So let's say I want to be, let's say I want to automate this workflow, it's going to run on a schedule, and I want to be alerted if, if this happens. I want to be alerted if any records come out of the left side here, uh, and I want to be notified. So I'm going to use something called a test tool. So I'll go up here, I find a test tool. I'm just going to show you this real quick and then I'll, I'll just take it out. I'm going to add a test tool. So the test tool allows you to test for a condition. I'm going to come up here and say, you know, um, add a condition. Um, maybe I'll say no transactions, no transactions. And I'm going to say, you know, um, alert me if the records are greater than zero. So what's going to happen now if I run my workflow and it finds that something came out of the L, notice the workflow breaks because that condition is, is broken, that condition was met. So now what I can do, I can actually, uh, as part of automating my workflow, I can come here to events and say, you know what, add a new event and then send me an email when this workflow run with errors. So now I'm notified, I'm kept in the loop uh, that something happened, I have an, I have an error. So this. You know, so now I can automate my workflow and be notified when, when something goes wrong. I don't want to do any of this, so let me just go ahead and just remove this. I just wanted to show you uh, what it would, it would look like if you choose to kind of automate uh, your workflow. So now, at this point, coming out of the join, I have, I have my data set, uh, combined data set. Let's say I, now I want to, now that I have cleansed this data, it's combined it, it, it looks nice. I'm going to go ahead and output it to um, maybe an Excel sheet, and I want to do different tabs for each one of the regions that, that came in. So uh, the way to do that, I'm going to get an output data tool and just add it to my workflow. 
And I'm going to um, actually output to uh, a flat file. And I'm going to say uh, webinar output or something like that. Maybe this is my customer list. And I'm going to go ahead and select Excel. Let's see. I have the different types. I can, uh, I can select this one, I guess, and click Save. I, I can give it a sheet name. But what I want to do, I want to make the sheet name dynamic. I'm going to say Overwrite in case I run this again. Now I want to make the sheet name, name dynamic. So I'm going to say take the file table name from a field, and I'm going to say um, it changed the file or table name. And now I'm going to select a field in my database to drive the name of the sheet. And in this case, it's going to be my region. So I select region here. And now if I run, you can see that I created an Excel sheet, R1, R2, R3. I can actually open one of these, drag it over here. And you can see I was able to output the summary that I created. This is all my cleaned up data. And then I select a different option here. I can see, let's see. Okay, maybe I selected a different option, change file table name. Let me go back. Table name. Okay. Oh, maybe because I have it overriding. Okay, let me check. Let me check that. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me give it another name. My. I just called my report. It's going to be Excel. Give it a sheet name. Now click run. And finish running. All right. So that's what happens when you're running something live and you are a human. Okay, there you go. So now it's creating uh, my report to Excel with these different uh, different sheets. But let's say this is not um, this is not how I finally want this. Maybe I'm using some visualization tool and I want to output this to a TDE file or maybe something to, to visualize it in another, in another visualization tool. What's really nice about this is I'm not tied down to one output. I can take the same data and I can output it to different ways. And I find this with, very handy with our customers because some of them say, well, I have to send the Excel sheet to somebody, but my executives, they want to see the, the, a dashboard or something like that. I can definitely output this to somewhere else to another file type. In this case, I'm going to just go ahead and select a TDE file, which is a Tableau data extract, and then give it a name. I just say T output, and then just go ahead and run it. And you can see in my messages now, it says 2,272 records were written to this um, this Tableau TDE file. Now I can open them. I can open this up in Tableau. I can build my uh, my workbook, and I can visualize my data. So at this point, now that, now now that I have automated, you know, prepping and blending the data together, cleaning it from all the different regions that are coming in, instead of spending you know my 26 hours a week uh, that I use on prep and blend on cleaning up this data, I actually now have time to do analytics that will bring value to my organization. Uh, and as you notice, the more I automate, the more time I'm going to have to actually go deeper and add even more analytics. Um, maybe at this point I can, I can leverage some of the predictive tools that Alteryx has. Maybe I can do spatial analytics or drive time analytics, you know, to find out how far my customers live from my stores or things like that. So really very quickly on, you know, uh, let's say I want to try to predict what is the likelihood of somebody responding to a marketing campaign. In my data, I have this responder field. So I have been collecting responder information on my customers. Maybe I want to predict the likelihood of them responding in the future. I'll just do this at a very high level just to show you 
that these predictive analytic models are ready to go for you out of the box. I'm just gonna quickly bring this logistic regression model, connect to my data, connect my data to the model, and um, I can give it a name, it's gonna, you know, something like marketing model. And I'm going to select what is it that I want to predict, so it's gonna be my responder field, whether they will respond to a marketing campaign. I can select the variables that influence that field, maybe the number of transactions, maybe the average shipping time, maybe how much time they spend with me. Uh, maybe I can add a spatial tool and then um, and figure out the distance uh, they have to drive to get to my store. So once I select these, these variables, I can actually run, and now I have a predictive a logistic analytics model um, that's built out of the box. This is erroring out because it's, uh, I don't have it on overwrite. So now I can do, um, and you can see the more I build, the more time I have to do uh, to do other things. So, and if you're interested in this, Altrix has many analytics kits to help you get started with advanced analytics. Um, if, you go, uh, if you go here under the help menu and you look at sample workflow, uh, you know, you see how you can do things like presentations, but you can all come and see some of these kits, starter kits for analytics, there's a starter kit um, for things like predictive analytics, learn how to do, you know, different models, uh, a force model, linear regression, logis logistic regression, these are all here as starter kits, and all, you've, all of these starter kits can be downloaded from uh, our website, uh, that will be ultrax.com uh, and then slash kits. I really hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've seen kind of how you can save and don't spend all this time on doing data prep and blend and actually move over and start doing some analytics. Um, Shannon, I'm gonna send it back to you, see if, uh, if there are any questions. Thanks, Hassan. Uh, would you mind quickly just handing me the ball really quick so oh. Shannon gets to the Q&A? Yes, I will do that. Somebody stole the ball from me. There you go. <laughs> I think you have it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Did you do it? <laughs> Shannon, would you mind passing me that ball while you do the Q&A? I thought I'd pass it to you. It looks like it just sent it to me. Yep. There you go. Great. Uh, so we're going to get to the Q&A here. Uh, the presentation will be made available to the rest of you guys who um, did the, uh, the, this presentation today. Uh, with that, let me pass this on to Shannon, who will we'll run through some of our Q&A. Fabulous. And just to uh, let everybody know to answer some of the most popular questions, uh, as Lisa mentioned, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, to the recording. And there's a lot of fantastic questions coming in, so if we don't have a good chance to get to your question today, I will forward them on to Altrex to get some answers, and maybe we can get some of those in the follow-up email as well. So keep them coming in, um, but we'll, we've got just a few minutes here to get to some of the great questions. Um, so uh, let me ask, you know, uh, is this, SQL engine on Excel files, and then what's the difference with Microsoft Access? Okay, well, if, if I understand the, the, the question correctly, you know, Altrex is, is, is really database agnostic. We can actually connect to any, any database. So if you're bringing stuff from Excel, from, from Access, from, from SQL, once you bring it into Altrex, it, it all looks the same to us at the, at, after that point. So uh, there's some limitations with the database. You have to have that driver installed and configured. We, we respect um, existing database permissions. So if you have permissions to that database or you have that data in an Excel sheet, well, I'd like to connect to it. So uh, what's the volume of data Altrix Designer can handle before running into performance issues? The only limitation that, uh, you know, and we've, we've had customers that use it in, in really great ways and bring in a lot of data up to, you know, a billion records. And my colleague who sits next to me at her previous shop using Altrix, she's a former user, she was able to bring in up to a billion records with the B right on her laptop, a company-issued laptop. So, you know, really the only limitation is your own physical machine and memory and hard drive that you have available. So we, don't forget we also have in database processing. So if you're concerned, if, you're, if you have big data characteristics type of data, uh, you can run this and then uh, write in the database itself. So we have in database processing as well. 
All right, and from one questioner, we have a few questions here. Um, so uh, do, you, do the predictive functions come included with Altrix, or are those uh, an additional cost, and can you import Excel formulas into Altrix? So uh, regarding the predict predictive, you have to download the predictive uh, uh, star get to, to get to get um, the predictive categories. Uh, what's important about this is that they're all written, they're all based on R, and then you can actually uh, open um, the, the predictive tools and edit the R code if, it's, if you wanted to do something specialized or more advanced or something that's specific to you. Uh, in terms, I think the second question was about Excel formulas. Uh, we, unfortunately, you have to rewrite some of those formulas in Alteryx if you have some custom formulas uh, that you are using in your, in your data processing currently. All righty. Well, I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for. What a great presentation, Lisa and Hassan. Thank you so much. And thanks to our attendees for everything we do. If you, again, we didn't have time to get to a lot of the questions today, but we will get those over to Altrex, too. We'll help follow up with those answers and get those to you. So if you want to keep the questions coming in, I will make sure and get those over appropriately. And again, uh, just a reminder to everyone, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording, and additional information requested. And um, again, thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love the participation, and I hope everyone has a great day. Again, thanks to Altrix for sponsoring, and Lisa Hassan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.